Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. Recently I have upgraded my main editing PC and I thought I should make a video about it since I have had a few people over the years ask how to build one. Fortunately, I have had some help from my buddy Vitor who filmed the whole thing for me, so I have a ton of b-roll to show you what the process looked like. Before we get into the meat of the episode, I have a few disclaimers for you. First of all, as always, None of the stuff is sponsored and all of the components have been purchased with my own money. I have no loyalties towards any particular brand. I just pick what I think does the job best. Second, I want you to understand that this is a professional high-end editing rig with the appropriate price tag. So if you're just starting out, there is no need for you to spend this much money on an editing computer. However, if you have questions about specific components that are perhaps cheaper, that I haven't mentioned in this episode, please leave all of those questions in the comment section down below and I will get back to you. Third, I will be talking about building an editing computer here. Not a gaming rig, not a streaming rig. Even though those occupations do share some common components, some will be less important than others. So please don't yell at me that I prioritized something over something else. I should also say that this video will primarily focus on editing in Adobe Creative Cloud because that's what I use on a daily basis. So I won't be talking about Avid, DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut is obviously Mac only. This video will get a little technical, but don't worry. I will try my best to explain what each component does to the best of my ability. So without further ado, let's get started. The first thing to understand is that building a PC is really about getting the appropriate components and assembling them together. It might sound a bit scary, but don't worry, there's no soldering, welding, or hardcore engineering involved on our part. It's all kind of been done already by other smarter people than me. So, the most important component when it comes to building an editing PC is the central processing unit, or the CPU. The CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer. Most editing applications are CPU bound, and more specifically, they are bound to a single core performance since most applications are not really optimized to take advantage of hyper-threading. And while it might be cool to say that you have 64 core CPU in your rig, the performance and editing software might actually be the same or even worse than that of its eight or 12 core counterparts. So when selecting a CPU, please make sure to read its single core speed which will be noted in gigahertz. For my build, I went with an Intel Core i9 12900K processor, which has a base clock speed of 3.2 gigahertz and a boost clock speed of 5.2 gigahertz, which is really, really good. You can always look up clock speed on the manufacturer's or store's website. Another reason why I went with Intel is because I have always used Intel and I tend to have a preference for Intel motherboards. I'm not interested in Intel versus AMD debate. Both Intel and AMD make good processors. And at this point, it all depends on your needs and your budget. While on the topic of CPUs, let's talk about CPU coolers. All CPUs produce heat and in the case of 12900K, a lot of it. So it needs to be cooled appropriately in order to last a long time. There are generally two ways to cool a CPU, liquid or air. Air coolers have a heat sink that sits on top of the CPU and there's a fan that blows hot air out to dissipate the heat. Liquid coolers have liquid that runs through the heat sink that gets cooled by fans that blow into the radiator. It works exactly as your car engine's cooling system. So which one should you get? I should put a disclaimer here. Some CPUs come with a stock cooler, which is fine for most cases. However, if you are planning to do overclocking or planning on running a lot of CPU intensive tasks, <clears throat> editing, then you should probably opt out for a really beefy air cooler or go with a liquid cooling option. For my build, I went with the NZXT Kraken X53 240mm cooler, which is fine for my needs. At the time of my purchase, kind of funny enough, it was also the only cooler that was available in the store, which would fit my new Z690 motherboard. If you will be buying a motherboard for the new LGA 1700 socket, please make sure that the cooler you have has appropriate mounts to be put on that motherboard. Speaking of the motherboard, second most important component of the PC build is the motherboard. A motherboard is basically like a home base for all of your computer's components. You connect all of your components to the motherboard and as a result, they're all able to talk to each other. 
I know it's a lot more complicated than that, please don't yell at me, but I'm trying to explain this in layman's terms here. When it comes to selecting a motherboard, one of the crucial specs that you must choose correctly is the socket type for the processor. On my Intel 12900K, the socket is called LGA1700. Therefore, the motherboard that I selected must fit that socket. I went with MSI Z690 Meg Unify motherboard because, as Gamers Nexus put it, it's a utility motherboard. So it has a lot of ports, and as an editor, there is nothing I want more than a lot of ports. And specifically, fast ports. USB 3.2 Gen 2, Thunderbolt 3, or Thunderbolt 4. I will make a separate video about USB ports at some point, or you can just check out the one that Linus made over on his channel. Besides the ports, this motherboard also offers the new PCIe Gen 4, DDR5 support, and 5 M.2 slots for fast NVMe storage. I should also mention that we are in a weird state right now when it comes to motherboards, and the main reason for that is the fact that DDR5 RAM just got launched. And as a result, you have several boards for the same socket that either support DDR4, previous generation RAM, or DDR5, new generation RAM. These boards are not cross-compatible, unfortunately, meaning if you choose a DDR5 board, you cannot go back and put DDR4 RAM into that board. I will touch on the differences in RAM in the RAM section, but here's what I think you should do if all of this RAM talk makes your head spin. If you're on the budget and are just starting out, get the DDR4 compatible board that has a lot of fast ports and save yourself some money. My old rig had Intel i9-9900K and was rocking the Designator Z390 board, which is excellent for older LGA1151 sockets. If you are a professional and you want to be future-proof and you have the budget, then by all means go get a new DDR5 board and saturate it with DDR5 RAM. And since we just talked about motherboards and RAM, let's wrap it up and talk about it some more. So DDR4 or DDR5? That's the question, isn't it? I've personally not tested identical systems with different RAMs in it, but to according to all of my research and everywhere that I looked, having DDR5 in your system does not improve results in Premiere Pro by much at all. It does improve results in After Effects under certain conditions. Maybe that is something you want to consider. And the only reason I went for DDR5 board was because I actually liked the motherboard. So for me, having a good quality motherboard mattered more than DDR4, DDR5 RAM. And that is why I got stuck with DDR5. Again, DDR5 by itself is not worth the money at the moment. What I would say is if you find a really good motherboard and it's a DDR4 motherboard, just get that saturate it with as much RAM as you need, save the extra money for other components in this list, and just wait until DDR5 prices come down. Maybe for your next upgrade, that's what you might want to put into, into your system. But at this point in time, it is just not worth it. I should also jump in and say that you should probably get at least 32 gigs of RAM, whether it's going to be DDR4 or DDR5, I will let you decide. But at least 32 gigs at this point in time should be your minimum. If you wanna go ahead and get 64 gigs or 128 gigs, be my guest. But what I noticed is you kinda of start hitting the point of diminishing marginal returns when it comes to RAM. For example, I have 64 gigs of RAM in my system and for most of my edits, I rarely go above 32 gigs. So, you know, that's kind of makes my 64 gigs pointless. However, if you are gonna be doing a lot of rotoscoping, for example, when I was doing my rotoscoping tests uh, on my PC, I realized that basically my 64 gigs of RAM were maxed completely out. So again, it always dependent on the task that you are doing when it comes to all of these components. If all you are doing is just cutting up two cameras in 1080 or 4K and you are doing barely any effects and very little uh, visual effects such as green screen, etc., you do not need a ton of RAM and you do not need an expensive GPU. So just keep that in mind. Back to the video. Next important component that we should consider for this build is the SSD. Most motherboards nowadays come with either one or several M.2 slots which support NVMe drives. NVMe drive is a lot faster than conventional SSD and with PCIe Gen 4 it can reach speeds up to 7 gigs a second, theoretically in ideal conditions. NVMe is the drive you should select as your main system drive. Considering that it's a PC and you can upgrade it later, I would start at least with a terabyte NVMe SSD and go from there. For my build, I went with Samsung Evo 980 2TB SSD. 
Considering that I was upgrading my old system and it had a two terabyte SSD, I knew that I needed a lot of space. In your case, that might not be the case. But hey, if you wanna go big and go big from the beginning, go ahead, I'm not gonna stop you. I should also say that I have been using Samsung Evo drives for a long time and I really like them. And they also have a free cloning program that you can install if you wanna upgrade your PC with more storage later. So that's kind of a benefit in my book. Okay, let's talk about power. To power your rig, you will need a PSU or a power supply unit. Having a solid power supply is extremely important because improper power delivery can damage your components and make all of that money that you just spent on your brand new shining PC disappear. Okay, not to be too dramatic, but it's true. Power supply comes rated by wattages that they supply to your computer. 500 watts, 750, 850, 1000, etc. To calculate the power supply wattage needed to power your computer, you should add the wattage drawn from all of the components in your system. And if that's too much work, then there are plenty of free sites for PSU calculators online available, and I will link to some down below. You basically just select your components and the system will calculate the power supply you need to accommodate that wattage based on their draw. Keep in mind, if you are planning to get a beefier CPU in the future or a bigger graphics card, you might wanna calculate that from the get-go if you wanna reuse that same power supply. For my build, I went with EVGA 1200 Platinum Power Supply. 12900K draws a lot of power, and considering that I will most likely upgrade my graphics card soon, I factored that into my calculation. PSUs also have a rating such as Bronze, Gold, or Platinum. I recommend at least a Bronze rating for your system. I went with a Platinum one. The choice is always yours. Okay, okay, fine. I can already hear the gamers in the background screaming and yelling at me for not talking about their most important component, and that is the GPU, or the Graphics Processing Unit. Or simply put, graphics card. Well, here's the truth, folks. Having a beefy, expensive, really pretty, sparkling graphics card is not important for an editing rig. What? What the fuck? I can already feel the tomatoes and onions flying my way. But that is simply the truth. GPU acceleration, while being helpful in Premiere and After Effects, does not require a ton of GPU power. Therefore, having a basic GPU like RTX 3060 is perfectly fine for an editing rig. While editing this video, I realized that I needed to jump back in and clarify a few things. So when I say you don't need a GPU for video editing, what I mean is you don't need a high-end GPU. Something like, again, 3060 RTX or even 2070 or 2060 is gonna be perfectly fine along with something like even a 1080. Because GPU in video editing is only utilized for very, very specific effects. Uh, those are GPU accelerated effects, which are not all effects that are being used when editing. It is also dependent on the program. So for example, DaVinci Resolve tends to rely a little bit more on the GPU than Adobe Premiere. But as I stated in the beginning of this video, most of my, all of my editing really is being done in Adobe suite of products. And Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects only utilizes GPU for very specific tasks. The bulk of your editing is gonna be CPU bound, as I said in the beginning. So again, do not dump a ton of money on an expensive GPU. You don't need it. Get something mid-tier, it's gonna be fine. The other thing I should say is obviously, because my system is built on Intel and Intel has built-in graphics, I don't actually need a dedicated GPU for the computer to function properly. However, if you are uh, building a system with a Ryzen processor from AMD, Ryzen does not have built-in graphics. So in that case, a GPU is a necessity simply for your computer to function. And in that case, my advice still stands. Do not go blowing your budget on an expensive GPU, save that money for other components, get something mid-tier, it will get your job done and spend that additional money on a better processor or something along those lines. Just had to jump in and clarify that because I know people are gonna yell at me for this. Anyway, back to the video. In my build, I have an RTX 2070 Super, which I bought a while back and reused from a previous setup, but I also have two other machines with RTX 3060s in them and they're perfectly fine. I also have a PC with a GTX 1080. I know, a dinosaur which is still, by the way, operational. So when it comes to editing, do not, I repeat, do not go blowing your budget on a graphics card, especially considering that they are hard to get nowadays and scalpers on the internet are charging obscene amount of money for them. 
The GPU shortage is getting better and you should check your local stores for availability. But please be rational about this and do not pay obscene prices to scalpers, okay? Cool. All right, with all of that being addressed, let's talk about a place where all of these components will live. I'm talking about the PC case. This part is really subjective because it all depends on what you like and what appeals to you. I have been using Cooler Master HAF EVO for several of my builds and I really like that case because of its utility, ease of access, airflow, and the fact that all of my components are sitting instead of hanging, like in vertical cases. I don't hate vertical cases, but it's just a personal preference. Two things you should be careful about when selecting a PC case. One, make sure that it fits your motherboard. Most cases will support ATX motherboards and smaller, but some of the smaller cases, while looking really cute, won't support all the stuff you're trying to fit into it. Second factor that you should take into consideration is the airflow. Make sure that you have decent airflow in your system to prevent your components from cooking to death. I know some designs might look really cool, but make sure that they also don't cause your CPU to thermal throttle or combust. I guess one last component in relation to the airflow I will suggest are high quality fans. A PC case will usually come with at least two of them, but make sure to check the packaging and details when you order the case to make sure that it has any. My case came with three fans, which I replaced with Corsair RGB ones because of the look, primarily. But your PC doesn't have to look like a Christmas tree. Trust me, I did go overboard with RGB when I was in college and yeah, I went a little bit cuckoo. But prioritize reliability of the fans over their shiny look and make sure that your airflow is either front to back or back to front, depending on the case. Make sure that the air can come in easily and come out easily. That way all of your components will be cool and hopefully happy. Okay, I know this was a long video and it was really, really, really technical. And if you're still with me, thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention and time. And here are some closing thoughts on the whole PC building matter. If this was too technical, please leave me a comment if you need me to clarify something. I know that's a lot of information and it can be tough to digest all of it at the same time. Keep in mind that there are a lot more accessories that can be added to a PC, and my main goal was to show you absolutely necessary bare bones component and rank their importance when it comes to building a PC. As a matter of fact, I can make a whole separate video about each one of these components, but there are a plethora of other channels that do so on a daily basis, and you should check them out as well. I will link to some of them down below. Once again, I know that some of the prices for my components were high, and if you're just starting out, you don't need to spend all that money on the top of the line stuff. Make sure you have a legitimate work reason to justify these kinds of purchases. And remember, if you can't find certain components because there is a shortage, just wait if you can. Okay, y'all, thank you so much for watching this video. Please leave any and all comments that you have Subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this, and I will see y'all in the next video.